You are welcome to Christian Singles Podcast. My name is Olusegun Mokolu, and in this episode, I'll be sharing on practices that will affect relationship. That is, church practices that could affect relationship. There are things that are done in some denomination, in some assemblies, that if care is not taken, will lead to terrible marriage for people. And some people, unfortunately, who have imbibed some of these wrong doctrines, have ended up in very terrible marriages. I'm going to be sharing some of them with you, and I'm going to play that. After listening to this, if there are some practices in your church about marriage or relationship that you are not clear about, you may please share it with me, and we may comment on it. The first thing I want to talk about is is this rule that when a brother has found somebody he wants to marry, he is then required to go and talk to the pastor. I find this to be extremely strange. And I've had instances where they will now call the sister and ask her to be praying. And I'm like, praying for what? You know, we should not beat about the bush in the place of prayer. We should not beat the air. We should not pray as if we are fighting shadow. So these are this is a practice that is very common, but which is not correct, which is not biblical. If a brother has found a wife, he should approach that wife. I have had a justification for such rule that if there is no such rule, some said, well, it will give room for brothers to be talking to different sisters. And I said, it means that church has been raising godless, worldly men. If a church has raised godly people, they will not be talking to every sister. Moreover, you don't correct a wrong with another wrong. You know, so a, as a brother, you are free under God to talk with a sister that you feel led that this is the sister you want to marry. And that sister is also free under God to question you, examine you with the word of God, and pray about you, and have her own persuasion. If she now decides she wants to go and tell her pastor, fine. But be careful who you tell these things to. Many times, people just guide you by how they feel about your situation. If they want you to be married, they may just say, go ahead. If they don't want you to be married, they may say that they don't have any any sign from God. You've got to be careful. The final decision of who you marry should be from you. Don't base your decision on another person telling you he has green light or he does not have green light. So as a Christian brother, and please, we are not preaching disobedience to authority. We want you to obey authority. But above that, we want you to obey the word of God. The word of God says, let her marry whomsoever she wills in the Lord. It is you who has found something. It is you who has to express what you have found. There is no way anybody could have expressed what I told my wife, like what I did. You know, when I found my wife and I went to her, what I said to her was, I said, uh, God has called me to suffer for him. Are you prepared to suffer with me? That was what I told my wife. That was my own proposal. No pastor can do that for me because they don't understand why I'm saying that. And um, I brought a paper where I had typed everything I want God wants to do with my life or that I felt God had told me he wants to do with my life. I had it written down and I gave my wife to sign. And, you know, and I said, see, go and pray. I'm not looking for a yes. You know, before I gave her the, the, the purpose, I said, I'm not looking for a yes. I'm not looking forward to you coming back to say yes. I want you to 
pray about this issue and see whether you are truly persuaded. You know, it's just like when Naomi was going and Ruth said they will follow Naomi. Ruth painted, uh, Naomi, sorry, painted a picture, a gloomy picture. And Oprah went back, but Ruth cleaved unto Naomi. That means this is the person who is ready to suffer with me. Ruth didn't go to Jerusalem because she felt she would get married there and have a life. She was actually ready to go and suffer with Naomi. That was the same uh, way I presented it to my wife, that I was going to suffer. Are you ready to suffer with me? And I'm not looking for a woman just telling me yes. You know, I want you to be sure of what you are doing. And they also made it clear that whatever response you are going to give, be sure about it. If you if you if your response is yes, don't come and say no because I won't come to you the second time. If your response is no, don't come and say yes. You know, so because I was, I'm not under pressure. If it is God, it will work out. If it is not God, let it not work. I don't even want it to work out. It is when you don't know God that you are you are pursuing a sister. You are you are you keep going, you keep pressurizing. What are you pressurizing? If you know where you are going in life and you know what you want to do, talk to a sister. Be very clear what you are saying. Be very clear where you are going. My wife knows what I want to do very clearly. You know, I, I'm well, I was very well defined. So there was no way, uh, or how should I put it? I had given her sufficient information to make decision. So there's nothing like begging, playing hard to get. No, 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 no. This is not a worldly relationship. This is a kingdom relationship. So I had to communicate the mind of God to her about my life. And I didn't oppress her to say I had a dream or I had a vision. I didn't say all of that. I allow things to work naturally, you know, even though I've had my own leading and conviction, you know, and I've also examined that is she born again? That was what the first thing I first of all I said. I said, tell me your life story, how you gave your life to Jesus. I really want to know. How life has been. What do you understand by being born again? Those were the things I asked her. Those were the most important thing to me. Let me say to you, if you are not sure somebody is born again, don't marry that person. Don't make that mistake. Don't. Ma- That's the first thing you must ascertain. If you have slightest doubt, please don't go ahead. You know, so these, these um, rules that you must go and talk to a pastor and so on, it's not right. Truth must be told. It is not right. A brother has seen a sister approach that sister. You are free under God to approach that sister. Don't subject yourself to rules that the people who make the rule are not going to suffer the consequence with you. The second thing is that they say that two people who want to marry should not meet with each other. They should not be with each other. Now, when you ask them why, They say, well, so that they do not fornicate. You know, at times we do not know the definition of sin. Jesus said, if you look at a woman and you lost after her in your heart, you have already committed adultery. How do you police that? You can't. If people you have raised in the church who are now 30, 28 years old and they want to get married and they still don't know what fornication is, then what have you done? What have you raised? Because there's no way two people will want to get married and we not want to know each other. If you don't give them this room, a lot of people have gotten married like this, only to discover many terrible things about each other because they never gave them opportunity. Now, don't get me wrong. If you know as a person personally that you will find certain situations difficult or tempting, Avoid such situation, flee. But it is not for a church to legislate and now say that a third person has to sit down there for, for the two of you to meet and have discussion. I do not know how anybody will sit down for the two of us to have discussion. My wife will come to my place in those days and um, we will look at scriptures together. There was even a time I said, see, buy raw food, come and cook it. I want to see you cook. I want to know how you can cook. And I said, see, even if you can't cook well, 
what it will do is not for me to quit the relationship. I'm not marrying for food. But it will help me to prepare my mind that my wife doesn't know how to cook. Her. So let me prepare my mind. And then we'll begin to look at alternatives and how I'm going to also buckle up to be cooking. You know, so, and she cooked, she did, she cooked very well. We really got to know. There's really nothing about my wife since I've gotten married that has been a surprise to me. You know, people say, oh, when you get married, you start discussing, discovering many things. To be honest, I've not discovered anything new from my wife than all the things I knew during our four year of courtship. So people have to me, you have to find out how, you know, I really want to marry somebody and you have opportunity to look at where he's living and you don't want to even, you know, look at it. When my wife, my wife saw how, we, how I'm living, where I'm living, I didn't have a washing machine, you know, and in the course of our courtship, one day she sent money to me and she said, please go and buy a washing machine and put in that house. And I put machine in, washing machine in that house. Thank God for her. So all the inadequacies she noted, she was building it because we, we had a courtship. We knew that this thing is for marriage. It's not, we are not dating. We are not doing boyfriend, girlfriend. We were clear from the day, moment she said yes. And by the way, my wife even said yes to me instantly. You know, there was no hard to play. She felt she, she already knew I was coming, you know, and she also said yes instantly. So we knew what we were doing. I asked her to, you know, to take me to her parents. And I think in their church, they don't do that. I have to first of all go and see pastor. You know, this is part of what I'm saying. And I told her, I said, see, I'm not going to see any pastor. I am going to see your parent. It is you I want to marry, and I, am, I have responsibility to your parent. Marriage is family, okay? It's family. It's not church. That's why it's not only Christians that get married. People of the world get married. It's family, so... I want to meet your family. I insisted and I had to meet her family. Why? I wanted to show myself to them so that they won't be hearing that their daughter, they've been seen now with somebody. I wanted them to know that, see, I'm responsible. This is the, I want to marry her and I want you to know me, you know. And the parents were so gracious. They asked me about uh, my salvation, which I was so happy because that, particularly the mom, that was what she was asking me that day. She was trying to find out about my salvation. And that's what every Christian parent should do. Not where does it come from? It's not from our tribe. He can't marry. No. Is he a child of God? Is he born again? That's what every parent should um, should look after. You know, then there, is, there are situations where the church will say that, okay, oh, we are not going to wed you. And then they destabilize people. Because we seem to paint this impression to people that there is something called church wedding. There is nothing like church wedding. What we have is two believers getting wedded in the assembly of the saints. So there's nothing like church wedding. The Bible says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every matter be established. You can wed in your city room. You can go to a, 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 a wedding registry or a, what is it called and get married there. You know, you can get, you can get wedded in different ways. You can get do just the engagement that we do, particularly in, in this part of the world. What we call engagement, that ceremony is enough. Uh, what we do in reception is enough. What is most important is two or three witnesses knowing that you are getting married. And then because we have we live in a legal society, you can then obtain a marriage certificate. As a woman. In our generation, don't be in the house of a man and not have a wedding certificate. And when you when you have that, when you are wedded, make photocopies. Let one of you keep the original, but the two of you should have photocopies with you, and keep it very securely. Don't be in the house of a man without a wedding certificate. It is not that certificate that makes your wedding, but because we live in a legal world. You need that document, and you must ensure it doesn't get destroyed from one end. You know, so make photocopies, scan copies, upload online, keep it very securely. Okay, it is God that joins. Before ever there was 
um, a judge or a court or anything that had been married. Before there was paper, there had been married. So paper doesn't make marriage and paper doesn't dissolve marriage. But for example, if you go to an embassy now, you say you are married. It, indeed, you are married. Before God, you are married. But they are not going to believe you until you present a paper. Okay, so that's why you need that legal uh, document. So don't let somebody create impression for you that um, if you don't wed in church, you don't have God's blessing. God had blessed marriage in Genesis chapter 1. Bible says, and the Lord blessed them. Okay, God had blessed marriage. Marriage is blessed um, already. You can wed anywhere. Our parents, God wedded in different places. Are they not still standing till today? Then there is this issue of marriage counseling. It's another practice in a lot of uh, churches today. Even though they have good intention, many churches have turned this to be a stumbling block. They've almost made it into an exam, into a terrible exam that if you don't pass, you are not getting married. Some are not all churches, but some churches have made it extremely difficult. And, you know, we live in a dynamic world. You know, you may have somebody living abroad and you are here and you want to get married. The person, they don't give them time for ceremony there. The person may come here and may have just two, three days. You know, but you want the person to come one week or one month to do marriage counseling. You know, where the problem lies, first of all, is this. As a pastor, your pastor should have prepared you all your life. From the day you started attending Sunday school, there has to be a preparation for life, for marriage, for ministry. There has to be a preparation towards that life, marriage, and ministry. That's what the church is all about. He gave some to be apostles in Ephesians chapter 4, I think from verse 10 there about, some to be prophets. Uh, teacher, pastors, evangelists for the work of the ministry, for the perfection or the preparation of the saints for the work of the ministry. So, why growing in church? What were they doing? Were they just ask? Were they asking you money, money, money? That's the problem with people who attend this money, money church, or die, 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 die church. They they spend their years growing up without even knowing the Lord, because they've been knowing the wrong thing. The devil has given them a substitute gospel. So you've got to be careful. So the, when it comes to marriage counseling, the first thing is that the church should have even prepared you. It is not that one month, one week counseling that is really going to make any difference. And even if you are going to do that, church should not stress people. Church stress a lot of people. I went through a lot of difficult time in going through marriage counseling before I got wedded. And incidentally, if, well, this may not be in all places, but... I remember in my own case, some of the things some of the counselors were saying that we met were not even correct. They were the weaknesses in their own life. You know, many of them didn't marry properly. Many of them don't even understand marriage. And now they have to be counseling us. And I had to take a short, small paper and be writing to my wife and say, this thing is saying is not correct. Though. We are not going to build our life on it. Our life will be built on the word of God. You know, so some may even miscounsel you, but I've seen instances where those cans, uh, pre, uh, pre-marriage counseling has helped some couples, you know, to discover certain things and, and so on. But the bottom line is the church should prepare people as a strategy, as a lifetime strategy, not to do emergency marriage counseling and then begin to frustrate uh, people. Some are just making it even difficult and harder and harder and harder today for young people to get married and they never went through any of this they will say oh they are doing it so that you can get it right the way to make people get married right is to teach them the word of god from when they are young the bible says teach a child in the way train a child in the way he should go and when he's old he will not depart from it so that's what you are supposed to do it's not just emergency program at the, at the end when they are now ready to be married. And most times those couples don't change that decision. No matter how wrong that relationship is, they just go ahead and marry because this is just a few weeks to their wedding. So it's not strategic and it's not wise. It's not strategic and it's not wise. So uh, we've got to be careful. Some of the things I've also had, you know, there are many, I can't exhaust them and I don't know all of them, but... I'm just sharing the ones that I've had. I've had people say that you must not 
uh, bring cake to your wedding reception. <laughs> you know, may God deliver us from religion. But you can serve rice at, uh, from wedding on, uh, at your wedding reception. You can serve rice, you can serve chicken, you know, you can serve, you can serve meat pie. Now, meat pie is made from flour. Cake is made from flour. <laughs> you know, that's the foolishness of religion. And they will stand. You know, men love to defend religion. They don't have the life of Christ, but when it comes to religious issues, that's when they will stand strong as if they are standing in holiness. That's not righteousness. What has, that, what has cake got to do? If people have the fund and they want to bring cake, that's their own problem. If they don't want to do cake, that's their own problem. Cake doesn't make your marriage, but don't legislate. You know, church, you are, you, are, you are legislating on things that doesn't concern you. Things that does not bother you. That I heard of a wedding where they told, when they saw the wedding cake, they said, what's this, what's this? And then they removed it. The very woman, according to what they told me, who removed it was the first one to cut out of the cake after the wedding. So you can see the hypocrisy of men. You know, so but don't allow anybody to impose rules on, on your life that are not scriptural. If they don't allow you, for example, to know the person you want to marry, and then you marry, it is you that will bear the consequence in marriage. They are not the one. So those who will not be at consequence with you, don't let them be the one that now make final decisions for you. I've also had somebody say that in a church, they said you must not tie balloon, you know, as part of your decoration in your reception. As well. it, it just feels that some people are jobless. What has balloon got to do? You know, for them, maybe they think, oh, it's worldliness. What? If people rent venue and they want to decorate it, how do you? What? Well, that's not worldliness. When the Bible says love not the world, neither the things in the world. For all that is in the world. Now, look at those things. What are those things? Lust of the eyes, love of the flesh, and pride of life. It didn't say material things. Television or this phone that I'm using in recording is not the things in the world. This phone is a material thing. I can watch pornography on it, or I can use it to share the message of our Lord Jesus Christ as I am doing right now. It depends. So those things are neutral. It depends on... What you want to do with those things. So what is there in, in wearing, in, in, in making the place beautiful? Uh, don't we decorate even our sanctuary? What, how do you define? If you don't like balloon, then you don't do it or you don't do it for your children. But you don't go and impose it and make it a marriage rule in church. I say you must not have. It is none of your business. You didn't even pay for the reception hall. You didn't pay for it. It's, it's not your money. So you, you have no right in any form, to dictate to people and say they must not decorate it this way, they must not decorate it that way. It's not under your purview. And understand, I'm not teaching rebellion or disobedience. I'm just teaching God's word. You can't be violating the word of God uh, and expect that people should comply to you. Peter said, judge for yourself. Shall we obey God rather than men? God didn't send you to impose such rules uh, such rules on men because you see when we begin to tolerate all of these things it continue to increase and then we just get to a point where you just turn the church to become legalistic and the church is no longer spiritual the church becomes dead and human organization takes over that is what has happened in in some circle you know and the, what they now have is just human organization so human being now dictating they can dictate whether you are a saint or you are not a saint. They can dictate whether your sin is forgiven or is not forgiven. Human beings are taking those decisions. That is how it starts. So we must not allow this type of things, you know, and do it humbly. Let people know that you are just standing to obey whatever you see in the word of God. Uh, but I will leave you with this warning. A person that is not going to suffer the consequence of a decision should not be the one that makes that final decision for you. You are the one that will be in the marriage with that person. Anything that person turns out to you, you are the one that will be facing it. So don't let people who will be in their homes watching TV be the one that will now push you through their own rules or, or whatever into a wrong marriage only for you to be weeping and crying, whereas they are eating with their wives and children and having great time. It is your decision. God had given you authority. He says, let her marry whomsoever she wills in the Lord. You have right and authority from God. It's just like your parent cannot say you should marry this or you shouldn't marry. God didn't give them that authority. If you choose who you are going to marry, you are not disobeying them. Even if they don't like the person, 
you are not disobeying them because you are the one that will face the consequence. They are the one that are violating the word of God, not you. So you need to be clear about it. Your parent cannot say, well, I, I forbid you from giving your life to Jesus. And then when you give your life to Jesus, they say you don't honor your parent. No, they don't have that authority to tell you not to give your life to Jesus. God didn't give them authority to determine who you are ma- going to marry. They can pray for you. They can teach you. They can counsel you. But the final decision is yours. It is the person you want to marry that you should marry. Your parents cannot dictate. They can't choose for you. They've lived their own life. Now this is your own. Let God guide your choice. Because ultimately, you are the one that will face the consequence of that choice. So like I said, I'm going to stop here today. If there are other practices in, the, in, in churches that about marriage, relationship, uh, that you are not cleared about or you want us to throw more light, you may please share them. Just message them uh, on WhatsApp. And then we will, by the grace of God, as the Lord gives us light, we will also speak on them. My name once again is Olusha Gumukulu. We send this podcast out daily. In case somebody had forwarded it to you and you want to be receiving it, all you need to do is to write us on WhatsApp. Please follow this instruction. It's very simple. Just write us on WhatsApp. I will call the number shortly and indicate your full name and marital status. It's very important. I've seen people, they will write us and just send their name. And we don't know what podcast to add, to add them because we have one for married, we have one for growing in Christ. So we need to know specifically what you want so that we can add you to the right broadcast list so that you won't be receiving something you never requested for. So it's very important. If you, ask, if you want somebody to be receiving this, don't forward their numbers to us. Because we are using a broadcast list. We are not sending it individually. And it's for them to receive it, they have to have our number saved on their device. So the number for which to write us is this, plus 234-818-615-7852. Also remember to share this podcast with other Christian singles. By the way, we have a free marriage course completely free, that will help you to understand better some of these things. If you are interested, just write to us by email and also state that you are single. Please state that you are single so that we send you the single form. We have another for married people. Now, the email address is BibleLoveHelper at gmail.com. BibleLoveHelper is written as one word, BibleLoveHelper at gmail.com just write a request for the enrollment form we'll send it to you the course is free you'll do it anywhere on your mobile device we have a youtube channel where we have lots of videos that will help you to understand marriage from a biblical perspective just go on youtube and search for hashtag bible love helper or just search for my name Olushegun Mokuolu. until next time when we bring another episode unto you by the grace of god My prayer is that the Lord will guide your heart with grace, with knowledge and humility so that you do not fall for the rule of men at the expense of the word of God. God bless you.